Welcome to the 35th Annual Economic Seminar. And for braving the elements, I'm Mark Zupan, proud dean of the Simon Business School. If any of you had any doubts uh, on Sunday about Poxitani Phil's uh, meteorological forecasting abilities, I think today's uh, weather should put those doubts to rest. Uh, we're very proud to have uh, sponsored this seminar uh, for the past three and a half decades. It's come together with all the right pieces. Uh, to introduce our two speakers, would like to uh, first welcome to the podium Sandy Walcott. Sandy has 40 plus years of commercial banking experience, uh, now heads up mid-market for J.P. Morgan Chase in the Northeast. Uh, J.P. Morgan uh, Chase has been a wonderful co-sponsor of the event over these years. Uh, we're proud to count many alums um, in the organization, including Sandy's boss, um, uh, Doug Petno, who's head of commercial banking and one of Jamie Dimon's direct reports. So without further ado, uh, Sandy, thank you for the participation and support. Thank you. Um, the good news is that uh, both of the uh, speakers are able to come here. They, they were smart and they uh, anticipated coming the night before. As you remember, Jim Glassman last year, we had him uh, just vocally because he got in the snowstorm. As we all know, he has a face for radio and so that uh, he's here in person today. So it's uh, my great opportunity and I love to do this to introduce Dr. Plosser. Uh, Dr. Plosser is president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and you've probably seen him a number of times on CNBC in the morning. Uh, in his role, he serves at, <clears throat> on the Federal Reserve System, Monetary uh, Policy Making Arm, and the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, he began his term as president and chief executive officer in 2006 and served during the global financial crisis and severe recession. During that time, uh, the Federal Reserve instituted the unprecedented uh, money <clears throat> monetary policy steps and lending operations to help mitigate the effects of the financial crisis and the economic downturn. Before joining the, the Philadelphia Fed, Dr. Plosser was the economics professor at the University of Rochester Simons School of Business, and he also served as dean from 1993 to 2003. He earned his MBA and PhD from the University of Chicago. Dr. Plosser. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks very much. It's, it's once again a pleasure to, to be here and to uh, have this opportunity to visit with you once again. You know, this is the 35th seminar of this series. I've spoken at every one of them. Uh, now, so I have two questions for you. Can't you find somebody better? <laughs> That's a very long time. That's a very long time. And it's pretty clear I'm a lot older than I was 35 years ago when I started doing this. There's a debate at the table and other places about whether I'm any wiser or not, but I certainly am a lot older than I was. So I want to, um, so I guess I keep getting invited back because I have to keep coming back until I get it right. And that either suggests I will die here at the podium or at some point I'll fade into the afterlife and, uh, and uh, move on to uh, greater things in the sky. But I am delighted to be here. You might wonder why it's true that seven years after I've moved from Rochester to Philadelphia, um, I still come back here each winter to give this talk. You know, when I made that comment about older and wiser, the fact that I keep coming back in the winter time is what should make you suspicious about whether I'm really wiser or not. Because it certainly isn't the weather, um, although I will note that the weather's rarely good when I come back here. I, I can't, I don't want to take responsibility for that, but I will say this. Here in Rochester, 
you're better at handling the snow than we are in Philadelphia. That's certainly for, true, for sure. But no, the reason I come back is pretty clear. It's about friends, it's about colleagues, and a community that I find remains vibrant and positive. So even in the wake of the polar vortex of 2014, I'm delighted to be here once again, see old friends and familiar faces, and I want to thank you for inviting me back and for that warm welcome from Sandy and all of you. So I've, requ I've acquired a great deal of respect for weather forecasters over the, last, over the years, especially in turbulent times. Um, because I've noted on, on very many occasions, forecasting, even in the best of times, is, very, is a very humbling experience. But nonetheless, I forge onward, and I'm once again going to venture into the unknown and try to offer you an outlook for the economy, as well as some views on monetary policy. I have to always note, though, and, and Jim will appreciate that, that the views I express are my own, not necessarily those of my colleagues at the Federal Reserve or on the Open Market Committee, so I speak for myself. They always are very appreciative of that for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Let me begin by uh, noting that this is a special time for the Federal Reserve. We are celebrating our, or observing, maybe not celebrating is the right word, but certainly observing our 100th anniversary. The Federal Reserve Act was signed by, into law by Woodrow Wilson on December 23rd, 1913. The 12 Federal Reserve Banks opened their doors for the first time in November of 1914. So, to balance the political and economic and geographic interests around the nation, Congress created the Federal Reserve System made up of these 12 regional reserve banks with oversight provided by a Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. Thus, we have a decentralized central bank, and it was structured to overcome political and public concerns that its actions might be dominated either by political interest in Washington or financial interest on Wall Street. Now, these 12 Federal Reserve banks serve a number of functions. They distribute currency, they act as a banker's bank, and they generally perform the duties of a central bank, which includes serving as the bank for the U.S. Treasury, with the U.S. government's fiduciary bank. They also play a role in supervising many banks and bank holding companies around the country. Moreover, the Federal Reserve Banks ensure that the Federal Reserve stays in touch with Main Street. Reserve Banks have boards of directors. Many also have branch boards. We all have advisory boards and contacts that provide the individual reserve banks with economic insight and information. Now these contacts allow the Federal Reserve Banks to keep up to date and knowledgeable about economic conditions in their regions. The reserve banks also collect data. They run surveys of economic activity and provide economic analyses. And this rich array of information and the diverse views from around the country help us, the Federal Reserve, paint a mosaic of the economy that is essential when we sit around to formulate monetary policy. Now, within the Federal Reserve, the body that, that makes monetary policy decisions is called the Federal Open Market Committee, or the FOMC. Here again, Congress designed this system with a number of checks and balances. Since 1935, the composition of the FOMC has included the seven governors in Washington, the political appointees by con that are approved by Congress, the president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, and the presidents of four other reserve banks who each serve one-year terms on a rotating basis. But whether, as individuals, whether we vote or not, all reserve bank presidents attend each and every FOMC meeting, they participate in the discussions, contribute to the committee's assessment of the economy and our policy options. The FOMC has eight regularly scheduled meetings each year to set monetary policy, and the first one of 2014 was just last week in Washington. So in normal times, the committee, the FOMC, 
usually votes to adjust short-term interest rates to achieve the goals of monetary policy that Congress has laid out for the Fed. So Congress established the current set of monetary goals in 1978. The amendments to the Federal Reserve Act specifies that the FOMC, and I will quote now, shall maintain long-run growth of monetary and credit aggregates commensurate with the economy's long-run potential to increase production so as to promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates, unquote. Now, you often hear people talk about the dual mandate. Well, buried in that language I just read to you, most people have interpreted to be a dual mandate. Why? Well, for one reason, they say that because when, that moderate long-term interest rates would be well served and achieved if you keep inflation low, keeps the nominal interest rate down. So that leaves the goals of maximum employment and price stability. And so many people have interpreted, and it is an interpretation, that the Fed has a dual mandate to maximize employment and price stability. So in order to determine the appropriate policy, monetary policy, uh, and to achieve these goals, the FOMC must monitor economic conditions. And so let me turn to talking about the economy. Now just as a reminder, I'd like to tell you that I, last year at this time I was here, I anticipated that the economy, that we would see about 3% growth in 2013, that the unemployment rate would fall to 7% during the fourth quarter, and that inflation would gradually, very gradually rise towards our target of 2%. Looking back on that, I sort of say, gee, that wasn't too shabby. It wasn't such a bad forecast. I can't say that every year so that when I can say that, I take advantage of it. All right, so so wasn't, so wasn't such a bad forecast. So far, the estimate of growth for last year, it's not 3%, it's 2.8, but there's still some revisions to come and we'll see what happens. So the difference between 2.8 and 3 is not, not very large. The unemployment rate indeed was 7% during the fourth quarter on average. Now, inflation has not risen quite as much as I thought it would, but it seems to have stabilized, and uh, so that wasn't so bad either. So let me look at some of the details about the economy as we, as we entered into 2014. My basic message is one is the economy is on much firmer footing now than it has been for a number of years. Real output grew at 3.2% in the fourth quarter, following a 4.1% growth rate in the third quarter means that economic growth in 2013 was essentially twice as fast in the second half of the year as it was in the first half of the year. Consumer spending, business investment and equipment ended the year with pretty strong increases. Inventory investment and net exports also contributed to growth over the last two quarters. While it does uh, somewhat of a decline in residential investment and a sharp decrease in federal government spending subtracted from growth in the fourth quarter. So I expect there will be less fiscal drag in 2014 than there was in 2013. And I do expect that the housing uh, sector will continue to recover. Personal consumption, for which account counts for more than two-thirds of GDP, advanced at an annual rate of 3.3% in the fourth quarter. That's the highest personal consumption growth rate since the fourth quarter of 2010. Rising house prices and rising stock prices have helped improve consumer balance sheets. And the steady job growth we've witnessed has added to wage and salary income, all of which tend to support consumer spending going forward. Now, the recent December employment report showed a payroll gains of about 74,000 jobs, which was below what many analysts had expected. Yet December's number was likely affected by some unseasonably cold wet and snowy weather in early December. And so it's not really clear by how much these numbers will get revised. But they are subject to revision. We'll get another revision on Friday. And those revisions can sometimes be significant. 
So because of these month-to-month -month revisions in the data and their volatility, uh, I prefer not to read too much into one number or the most recent number because I know it's going to get revised. Instead, I tend to look at averages over longer periods of time to sort of ascertain where the economy has been and sort of where it's headed. <clears throat> Firms added, on average, 182,000 jobs a month during last year. That's about the same pace that they added jobs in 2012. So what we've seen over the last two years is a pretty steady pace of job growth north of 180,000 a month on average. The unemployment rate dropped to 6.7% in December. That means the unemployment rate fell 1.2 percentage points um, last year. It also ended the year, the unemployment rate, ended the year at a lower level than the FOMC anticipated in its projections that we did back in September of 2012 when we started the current asset purchase program. That is to say, the labor market performed noticeably better than we anticipated, at least according to the unemployment rate. Now, should we be skeptical of the unemployment rate as an indicator of labor market conditions? Some people are. Some people are skeptical. And they think because the unemployment rate decline reflects a decline in labor force participation as well as increases in employment. There's even some concern in some quarters that the unemployment rate is actually going to move back up significantly when discouraged workers return to the labor force. However, based on some research done at the Philadelphia Fed, I am dubious of such claims. First, it's important to realize that the labor force participation rates have been declining since the year 2000. They are on a long and steady decline. These declines are driven primarily by demographic factors, most notably aging of the baby boomers. That trend is ongoing, and it will continue, and it was expected to accelerate as baby boomers more rapidly age and begin to retire. Second, detailed analysis of the current population survey's microdata indicates that much of the decline in participation rates since the start of the recovery, which would be June of uh, 2009, most of that decline in participation rates can be explained by retirements and movements into disability. Now, some of these increases, particularly the retirements, may have been driven by the state of the economy. As some baby boomers, for example, said, well, I'm going to retire in two years anyway. I lost my job. I'm OK. Housing market has improved. Stock market's gone up. I'm just going to go ahead and retire. So they, moved, they may have moved their retirement decision a little earlier than they other, otherwise would have. But those people aren't going to come back out of retirement. The evidence that re once you retire, you don't move back into the labor force. And those with disabilities obviously can't move back in the labor force because if they could, they weren't eligible for disability in the first place. So while I do expect there to be some discouraged workers coming back into the labor force as the expansion picks up steam, and while they search for jobs, we could see some upward pressure on the unemployment rate. Nonetheless, I don't think that's going to be significant. And I believe that the unemployment rate continues to be our best single summary statistic of the state of the labor market. So the business sector is also entering the year on a positive note. At the national level, manufacturing activity accelerated over the final three months of 2013. The Philadelphia Fed's Business Outlook Survey, which is generally regarded as a pretty good indicator of national manufacturing trends, also showed that manufacturing activity picked up in the second half of 2013. In January, our survey's General Activity Index posted its eighth consecutive positive number. Expectations for manufacturing activity six months ahead also remain strongly positive. This gives me some hope that business fixed investment, which has been somewhat lackluster over this recovery, will actually have some hope of picking up steam uh, 
in the fourth quarter. I mean, picking up steam in the year to, in the year ahead. We turn to inflation. Inflation has been running below the FOMC's long-term goal of 2%. Many people have made a big deal of this. The Fed's preferred measure of inflation is the year-over-year -year change in the price index for personal consumption expenditures, what we call the PCE deflator. It grew at just 1.1% last year. It's very important for the Fed to defend its inflation target of 2%, both when the inflation rate's too high and when it's too low. But I believe inflation is actually likely to firm up. Economic growth is accelerating, and some of the factors that have held inflation down over the last year, such as a one-time cut in payments to Medicare providers, some of those factors are going to abate over time, and they'll flow out of the numbers. Another additional and important determinant of actual inflation is consumer and business expectations of inflation. In that regard, I'm encouraged that inflation expectations remain near their longer-term averages and consistent with our 2% target. Thus, overall, I anticipate, as the, F, as the whole FOMC indicated, um, that inflation is likely to move back towards our target over time, perhaps at a slow rate, but nonetheless move back towards 2%. Indeed, given the large amount of monetary accommodation that we have added uh, and continue to add to the economy, I think there's actually some upside risk that over the longer term we actually miss the higher than desirable, uh, desirable inflation. Although growth in the first quarter I think is likely to be somewhat slower than the fourth, the last two quarters we've experienced. I think those were uh, very positive, but I think it'll be somewhat slower in the first quarter. Um, I still anticipate that over the coming year, 2014, that we'll see something that looks like another 3% growth rate. Now, 3% is not the robust, booming economy that many people have sort of looked for and wanted to see. They want to see growth rates of 5 6%. I don't really see that in the cards. I think we'll con continue to see steady growth of about 3%, give or take a little bit. And indeed, that's consistent with where most of my FOMC colleagues are for next year. Now, that growth rate of 3% will continue to lead to declines in the unemployment rate over the next year. And I believe that unemployment rates will be around 6.2% by the end of the year. Um, and that may actually be pessimistic, but, um, but that's where I see them. However, when I say 6.2% by the end of 2014, that actually makes me somewhat more optimistic than some of my F FOMC colleagues. Their central tendency of forecast for unemployment rates tend to be around 6.3 to 6.5, so I'm a little more optimistic than they are. Now, of course, with any forecasts, there are risks. And the current volatility in emerging market currencies could pose a risk um, that could spill over more broadly to other financial markets. But at this point, I don't consider that a significant risk for the U.S. economy. So while I think there continues to be some downside risk that we see going forward, for the first time in a few years, I actually see the potential for some upside risks to the economic outlook as well. And I think that when we consider monetary policy, we must consider not just downside risks, but upside risks as well. So let me turn to monetary policy for the moment. Over the past five years, the Federal Reserve has taken extraordinary policy actions to support economic recovery. The Fed's lowered its policy rate, the federal funds rate, essentially to zero, and it's been there for five years. Since the policy rate cannot go any lower, the Fed has attempted to provide additional monetary accommodation through large-scale asset purchases, or what we call, some people call quantitative easing, QE. We are now in our third round of quantitative easing in these purchases. And these purchases have greatly expanded both the size and lengthened the maturity structure of the assets on the Fed's balance sheet. The Fed is also using what we call forward guidance as a policy tool. And forward guidance is simply a policy tool 
that we use to say something about the future path of policy, to inform the public about where we think monetary policy will be over time. That's forward guidance. In this dimension, the FOMC has indicated that it intends to leave the policy rate near zero well past the time the unemployment rate falls below the 6.5% threshold we previously indicated. Indeed, the FOMC previously indicated that 6.5% um, that unemployment was the earliest point at which we would consider raising rates especially if projected inflation continues to run below our committee's 2% target. The forward guidance on asset purchases, has, the FOMC has indicated that purchases will continue until the outlook for labor market has improved substantially in the context of price stability. Now, with the economy having improved so substantially over the last year, and the outlook brightening, the time has come, I think, for the FOMC to slow the pace of purchases and to slow the pace at which it is adding to monetary accommodation. That is, we need to ease our foot off of the accelerator. My personal view is that the process should have started sooner and proceeded more expeditiously. But nevertheless, the FOMC did decide in December to take a very modest step in this direction by reducing the pace of asset purchases from $85 billion a month to $75 billion a month. And last week's decision reduced this by another $10 billion to $65 billion a month. The FOMC indicated that if incoming information broadly supports the expectation of ongoing improvement in labor market conditions and inflation moving back towards target, we will gradually, we will, we will likely reduce the pace of purchases further in measured steps at future meetings. Former Chairman Ben Bernanke in, indicated in his December press conference that if we were making progress in terms of inflation and continued job gains, then the program would likely be concluded sometime later in 2014. Notice that even though we are reducing the pace of purchases, of longer-term assets, we are still adding monetary policy accommodation. As I noted earlier, I believe the economy has already met the criteria for substantial improvement in labor market conditions, and the economic outlook has improved as well. So my preference would be that we conclude the purchases sooner rather than later. Indeed, before the decision in December, I had proposed that we set a total amount of purchases of additional securities that we plan to buy and then stop the asset purchases when that amount was reached. My view was that um, this would reduce policy uncertainty and thereby benefiting the economy. There continues to be some uncertainty about how we will manage asset purchases. The December FOMC announced a reduction in purchases indicated that they were not on a preset course. But the committee continued on this path in January. And while this wasn't my preferred path, I supported the action as a step in the right direction. I reasoned that by following through with another measured uh, step down in purchases, the committee was strengthening the signal to the public that the process would continue and then therefore reducing policy uncertainty going forward. While I may have preferred a somewhat more aggressive scale back, I was pleased that the FOMC is taking this first, these first two steps toward bringing this program to an end. That said, I believe there's a good case that can be made for speeding up the pace of purchases um, as the economic, if the e economy plays out as I expect. As I noted earlier, the unemployment rate fell 1.2 percentage points this year. Into the year, at 6.7%. It's a much small, sharper decline than most people anticipated when we started the program. Back then, in September of 2012, when we started this, the committee's expectations for unemployment at the end of 2014 was between 7.6 and 7.9 percent. 
We're now at 6.7, a full percentage point below where we thought we would be. If the employment rate continues to fall at this pace, we're going to reach that 6.5% threshold very soon. <laughs> In fact, some people may even say we may even, may even reach it as early as March. Now, the FOMC has indicated that it doesn't necessarily anticipate that it would raise rates when we reach 6.5%. But having said that, though, we certainly have complicated our communication strategies once we get there. What is the argument for continuing to increase monetary policy accommodation when labor market conditions are improving rapidly, inflation is stabilized, and the outlook is for it to move back towards our target. The longer we continue to purchase assets in such an environment, the more likely we will fall behind the curve in reducing monetary policy accommodation when the time comes. With the economy awash in reserves, the cost of such a misfire could be considerable and considerably higher than usual. It could foment higher inflation in the future, and perhaps financial instability. My preference is to scale back our purchase program at a somewhat faster pace to reflect a strengthening economy. I'd like to see the purchases concluded before the unemployment rate gets to 6.5%, before it reaches that threshold. And that's likely to occur, as I alluded to, probably the first half of this year. So in summary, I believe the economy is continuing to improve at a modest pace. We are likely to see growth of about 3% this year. Prospects for labor markets will continue to gradually improve. And I expect the unemployment rate to fall to about 6.2% by the end of this year. I also believe that expectations of inflation remain stable. That's good. And that inflation will move gradually back towards our target of 2%. On monetary policy, we must begin to back away from increasing the degree of monetary policy accommodation in a manner that's commensurate with an improving economy. Reducing the pace of asset purchases to $65 billion a month is moving in the right direction, but it may be insufficient if the economy continues to play out as the FOMC predicts. I believe the economy has met the criteria of significant improvement in labor market conditions, and thus well, those were the conditions for ending the program. And I think further additions to the balance sheet, further purchases, are unlikely to be very helpful uh, for the recovery. A case can be made for ending the current program um, uh, uh, sooner to reflect the improving economy and lessen some of the communications challenges we'll face. Even after the asset purchase program is ended, monetary policy will still be highly, highly, highly accommodative. As the expansion gains traction, the challenge will be to reduce the accommodation and normalize policy in a way that ensures that inflation remains close to our goal, the economy continues to grow, and that we avoid sowing the seeds of another financial crisis. In sum, the Fed still has its work cut out for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bosser. Well, this is great. Um, before I get into a little some remarks that I have, I'd like to acknowledge the Rochester Business Alliance and the CFA Society of Rochester for also helping out in this event. Um, each year, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase sends out a business survey by this person, as you can see right here, who is, as Mark said, Doug Petno, the head of the commercial bank, the one who decides my bonus, and I think all of you could send him a letter this year, and it was a little weak. Um, but He's the one that does it. Um, he got last year the Outstanding uh, Simon School Alumni Award and on the cover here, so I think he's due to do a big contribution to the school, uh, to the Simon School. Mark and I are going to work on that for him. But he sends it out to CFOs and CEOs 
And I thought I'd just give you a couple little snippets of what they found out last year. And so last year we, we looked at it, and d despite the growing uncertainty surrounding the U.S. economy, U.S. businesses were cautiously optimistic, and that's kind of a catch-all word, cautiously optimistic, and continued to, to grow organically. More than 70% of the business leaders had a bullish outlook for their own performance, and more than half of the businesses saw increased sales and profits, which is a good sign. They weren't just causing growth by just reducing expenses, but also raising that top line, the revenue. Although businesses were optimistic about their own growth, they took more of a cautious approach in borrowing. We saw that, and I think anybody in the banking industry knew that uh, loans were down, uh, to, growing un to the growing uncertainty in the U.S. economy. Business leaders remain very concerned about the rising taxes and the mounting health care regulations. Uh, in a second, you're going to hear from Jim, who's going to give you some more exciting news. And I think if we look at kind of the first couple months that I see with us in the uh, banking world, that uh, we're starting to see signs of improvement uh, with our clients taking down their lines more. And we're starting to see more activity in merger acquisition, which is very, very, very good. So, but before I introduce Jim, I'd like to acknowledge one thing, and that is, after 32 years, I know he's dying right now, after 32 years with J.P. Morgan and its predecessor banks, Bob Ryan, who is the market manager for the upstate market <coughs> division, uh, has announced his retirement. And if anybody saw that in the, uh, the Rochester Business Journal uh, last Friday, there was a picture of him and uh, comments there. And, what I'd just like to say is the, the following, and I think I said some of it in the, in the business journal, that um, number one, I can't imagine working with a better person. Number two, uh, he's been a great business partner with me. And number three, he's definitely the person you would want in the trenches with you when you saw the enemy coming over the hill. Now he's retiring. Uh, but he said he's going to work uh, after he decides what he wants to do. And I, I think that he's going to be handing out his resume at the bottom of the escalators uh, as everybody leaves. Uh, the other thing is <clears throat> Bob is only 55. I'm a lot older. I must have overpaid him for a little while, I think. But I just want to uh, have him stand and let's all acknowledge him. Bob? All right, now for Mr. Glassman. What would you think of an individual who you get an email at 10.30 this morning saying, Sandy, is this, <clears throat> is this meeting at the 49th floor at 270 Park or the 50th floor at 270 Park down in New York? <clears throat> Thanks, Jim. That, that was real helpful. I told him it was the 60th floor at 1 CMP <laughs> down in New York. Um, but great opportunity. Jim's here this year. We don't have him by voice. Uh, Jim is the managing director with J.P. Morgan Chase and is the head economist for the commercial bank in which this person runs. Um, he works closely with the firm's commercial banking groups, the investment banking groups, and our government relations groups. Uh, he publishes independent research on principle focusing, shaping the economy, and financial markets. From 1979 through 1988, uh, Jim served in a number of areas uh, with the uh, research and statistics and monetary affairs of the Federal Reserve, and he joined the bank in 1988, and uh, he received his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois, and subsequently he was awarded his Ph.D. in economics from Northwestern. Jim Glassman. Congratulations, Bob. <clears throat> um, disclaimer, the views that uh, you hear here, here in this age of personal responsibility may not even be my views. <clears throat> I don't know whose views they are. <clears throat> um, you know, one of my favorite things I did last year, if you take a little drive 
Uh, you come to a little town in New Mexico called Socorro, uh, where the first, Conrad, the first Hilton was built. That's where Conrad Hilton came out of. If you drive west for about an hour, up into the upper uh, high desert, go about, go about an hour west, you come to this amazing place that you may have seen in a film, uh, Jodie Foster's film, Contact, uh, a long time ago. Uh, you come to, to this high desert area, and what you see is this vast array of massive antenna that are pointing into outer space. They call it the VLA, Very Large Array. What we're trying to do is listen for intelligent life in outer space. They told me that it used to be pointed to the Earth, and they couldn't find anything. <laughs> so they pointed it up to the skies. I think if they had maybe directed away from Washington toward Rochester, maybe they would have found something. Um, j just a couple of housekeeping things that I think, uh, things that come to mind that you may have heard of and I think are worth keeping in mind. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, but last late spring when Ben Bernanke and his colleagues began to hint about the desire to start tapering, um, the market reacted very dramatically, long-term interest rates backed up, um, and, you know, the good thing to remember, by the way, is that we in the markets are very forward-looking. We understand when the Fed starts changing the story, we understand what this means. And for investors who heard this coming, they didn't care how it happened. They didn't care when it happened. The reason the market reacted so much is because we anticipated that eventually uh, the Fed is not going to be buying assets and you as an investor don't want to be buying. So in my mind, much of the reaction to the tapering that the Fed is doing this year um, has already happened. And in fact, we saw the housing industry react a little bit to it, things slowed down a little bit, and now it seems like things are starting to pick up again. But there's another thing to be aware of. The Fed may be tapering, but so is the Treasury. The flow of the deficit has been coming down, so that means the flow of new securities coming to the market has been coming down also. So from a flow of funds perspective, there's not a whole lot of change here. The Fed is still buying, but the flow of new securities coming into the market is also down from where it was. So that may be why you're not seeing, you know, if you look at the Treasury market, a lot of this reaction, and, and particularly if you look at the real interest rate, the tips yields, the, the forward tips yields moved up from zero last spring to about 1.5%. And, and that tells you that the market is really digesting the meaning of this and has done an awful lot of the anticipation of, of what's coming. Now... Um, one other thing, when this was all going on and the market was uh, turbulent for a while, you, I heard many people saying in the market that part of the problem here is that we all know that there's a transition coming at the Fed, Ben Bernanke would be stepping down, and whenever there's a transition at a central bank, it makes you nervous. And I heard many people say, gee, and the problem is we don't really know what the Fed's long-run goal is. And I'm thinking to myself, you've got to be kidding me. The, 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 what we have learned over the last several years, and I don't think there's any central bank on the planet that's done a better job of trying to explain what is their long-run strategy. And I think, as, as, as innocuous as it might seem, I think personally that putting a number on that inflation target, what it is that the Fed is trying to achieve, tells you everything you need to know. Because, you know, we don't really know where the level of unemployment is that constitutes full, full employment. We're going to change our minds many times. But there's no doubt about, there's no, there's no question about the inflation target. We now know, and there's no ambiguity about it, that in, in inflation around 2%, the measure the Fed looks at, is what's driving the Fed's actions. So if they're, if they're wrong and it appears that inflation's picking up, you will see a response by the Fed and we, we all know in the markets, we know what the objective is here now. There's no doubt about the Fed, and it doesn't really matter who's running the Fed. They've done a very good job telling you what it is, what the goals are of the central bank. And the truth is a lot of the major uh, central banks have really moved in this direction. Virtually all the cent key central banks have embraced the idea that a 2% inflation is the right idea. Which, by the way, is why the, the reason why you, you hear some people in academic communities say, Gee, you know, wouldn't it be better if we just kind of aim for a higher inflation rate? 
uh, because it would, it, would, it would give the Fed more room to do things when we get into trouble. The, the problem is it's taken us many decades to get to this point. And building credibility and the confidence of the financial markets is absolutely central. The, our whole, all of our assets are priced around the idea of 2% inflation. If you look at the break-even spreads in the treasury market, we in the financial markets have moved where we've moved because the Fed has a lot of credibility. And you may disagree with their views about the outlook. You may disagree with my views about the outlook. But the truth is, if the reality is that inflation begins to move up and it looks like the 2% inflation target's not going to be hit, you, you know, we in the markets know that the Fed will respond. And that's a really, a really big step forward that, to me, has made it quite clear what it is that the Fed means, what their long-run strategy is. So I don't think there's any doubt about the transition, about what the Fed's long-run goals are, and I don't think that the transition that we're going through is going to be changing any of that. Now, one more thought on... Um, <clears throat> One more thought on the stock market, only because my wife was asking about this. What's going on? <clears throat> um, I'm telling my wife, look, don't, you know, when the tide's coming in, you'll always see waves go out. Don't get nervous about this. Um, she's not really a buyer of that idea. But um, here's, I think, you need a little perspective on what's been going on here. What, what's happened in January, market's down a fair amount, but I think if you step back and you ask yourself, where, what's going on here relative to where we've been? I mean, really, uh, the, the market's been rising for a long time. If the market did not go through corrections, I would fear that we don't have a real market. This is sort of a natural process that goes on. And I think the thing, the thing that I'm wrestling with, and I think all of us are wrestling with, we in the markets are having a hard time understanding why did the market rise 30% last year when earnings aren't doing much. And I honestly think um, what I'm trying to show you on this picture, I don't know if you can see the... Um, it seems like one of the one of the shaded areas out. I'm showing you price at the Wilshire 5000 index superimposed on top of earnings, and I've done it in a way so that when the Wilshire index is equal to the historical average price earnings ratio of about 11 times earnings, the black line will sit on top of earnings. And really, what's been going on is for the past five years, earnings have been recovering very strongly, and stock market really has not been responding that aggressively. And I think what's going on is we're trying to, we're trying to get our arms around something big that's going on in the business sector. After-tax profits of American businesses as a percent of GDP, this is not something we were taught happens when we were in school. In modern, advanced, developed economies, the distribution of income is very stable. And so we're used to seeing the profit share moves around but what we're watching here for the last 15 years is the margin has been widening and it looks like the pendulum's been swinging. And I personally think this is a story about not only fast-paced innovation that is catching everybody off, off guard, but globalization. And it's the companies, it's all of us who are on the front lines of this stuff that's going on in Asia and developing economies that are benefiting first. And so um, I think we in the markets have had a hard time dealing with this because we see when we see margins driving dramatically different from what they've been, your tendency is to think that this has got to normalize and it's all going to come back. And what I think what's happening is people are starting to realize there's something big going on in the world economy, lots of opportunity out there that's opened up, and it's going to be this way probably for a while, and it's going to take time to get things normalized. For me, that just spells lots of opportunity. And if you're connected to this directly or indirectly or seeing what's going on, in the Asian region, this is an amazing story. And I think this picture kind of puts a face on it. it to me, it's the face of, of uh, globalization. Now, um, on, the, on the outlook, I think, you know, the reason I think you got to sort of breathe a little when it comes to, when you see what's going on in the stock market, I think, I think um, as you think about what lies ahead, there's three reasons why I think you've got to, the, the, it tells you the fundamental backdrop is really quite favorable. First of all, inflation is very low. I always learned in school when inflation is low and below your central bank's goal, um, you have more latitude for being accommodative. To get inflation back up, you've got to have a lot of growth. Secondly, the developed economies, advanced economies are all sort of coming out of recession, we're not there yet. We've got a ways to go, and I'll give you a visual to think about that. And thirdly, what's going on in the developing economies, uh, they want to be where we are, and they're probably in the third inning. 
a lot of these countries, India, China, for example, which means there is a lot of possibility, a lot of growth coming as the, the advanced economies get moving and as the developed economies continue. So I really think that that's the, th those are the themes that are really behind a lot of what's going on in the equity market and it makes it kind of hard to be nervous about it when you see months like we just went through because to me there's just so much good stuff lying out there that tells you there's a lot coming and I, don't, I only think we're only part way there. So um, what I'm showing you on this picture is my own vision of uh, how to think about the U.S. economy. I'm expecting, you know, we, 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 as Charlie told you, we grew almost 3% last year. I think we're going to be growing a little faster this year, maybe 3.5% for a while. We're going to be growing a little faster, and then slowly we get back down uh, to, to something more uh, closer to our long-run trend. Um, I, think, I think the thing to be aware of, and I, and I think a lot of folks are not real impressed by this, because the truth is we're not there yet. In my book, we're probably only halfway to where we want to be, and we, we, could, we could debate this, but this is what I have in mind. This picture is giving you a visual of how to think about where we are, and it's trying to make the claim that we are in the fifth inning of uh, economic recovery. And what I'm showing you on the bottom line is employment. It has increased by about 7 million since the bottom. The, sh the green shaded area, in the band in there, is my notion of kind of where we want to be to get uh, the economy back to full, full employment. So to get those folks who are actually called unemployed, they're actually out there looking for a job, so they're classified as unemployed, there's about four million of them uh, that are out there over and above the, the level of unemployment where we were back in 2007. Now, some people say, well, our natural level of unemployment might be higher. But to get back to where we were back in 2007, we've got to get up to the bottom of that green shaded area. Now, what I'm really interested in, and I think what we're all confused about, is as Charlie said, there are demographic forces driving a slowing the labor force. I'm not, you know, folks who are over 55 years of age or who are retiring, um, um, there, you know, that process is going on and that's going to be slowing down the labor force. I'm more interested in a population that you may know something about, uh, the population that's under 45 years of age, um, that dropped out of the job market. They came out of school, had a difficult time finding things. I'm kind of very interested in the class of 2008, because that's my personal interest. Uh, and I've become an expert in what's going on with the class of 2008, which is the first year they really had a trouble. Now, if you look at the participation rates of all these people, class of 2008, 2009, the 28 year olds to the 22, to 22 year olds, um, they dropped out. If somebody has figured out how you go from college to retirement at the age of 28, I'd like to know the trick. Um, but I think my guess is an awful lot of people know some of this population, and that's the population that's in the that green shaded area. So I'm looking at the 45 year olds and under who dropped out. I'm assuming they don't want to go retire. I'm assuming they, 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 they came out. I've learned a little bit about this from my own personal experience. Some of them are working in NGOs in Nairobi. Some are teaching English in Thailand. Many went back to school. Two, two to three million people went back to school. Um, as these folks find out that there's something here and, and the job market is actually beginning to open up for young people, um, they will be coming back in to the job market. It doesn't mean the unemployment rate goes up, it just means that the steady progress we've been seeing over the last several years, may, may, it may slow down and don't be nervous about it. If you start to see the labor force picking up speed and the unemployment rate's not going down, we economists are gonna be sharing that because that will mean that this generation that, that dropped out has, uh, is, is starting to come back in. Some people worry that there's a, that, that, that our young people, that there's a whole generation that's atrophying. They don't have a job, they're gonna be difficult to hire. I don't think so. If you know, if you know a 28 year old to a 22 year old, what you know is this generation has come into a very difficult world. They were told by their parents, all you gotta do is work hard, get good grades, get a nice resume and life is there for you. And in, what they found out that parents can't fix the job market. You need to work hard to make yourself employable and getting more schooling is an important part of that. So I really think that this generation is lucky in a sense. They will look back many years later and feel lucky because they woke up to a very challenging environment and it's making them do things that my son, who's older than my daughter, 
uh, did not have to, to deal with. So I really, I don't fear for this generation. I think that these are important lessons we're learning and I don't think anybody's gonna, I don't think anybody that I know of has any difficulty hiring people who are in this population. So I'm expecting we're gonna get there eventually, but it's gonna take a little more time. And finally, at the end of the day, it's all about inflation. If inflation's running 1%, and, and, and the Fed wants inflation to be closer to 2%. It takes a little bit of growth to get there. And what that means is we still have some work to do in the, in, the, in the days ahead. So we've been at this for about four and a half years. I wouldn't be surprised if it takes a little bit, you know, something like that to get fully back to, to where we need to be. Um, now, interesting thing to me, just a quick comment about New York. Um, if, if, if a lot of what's going on right now was all about gas shale and the energy development, you could say, you can understand why Texas is booming and why Oklahoma, state of Pittsburgh, eastern Ohio, North Dakota. But the fact is, all across the country, we're all moving upstream. We're all swimming upstream, even in the states where the real estate problems were very severe. They're, we're all doing the same thing. But it wouldn't, to, to me, one thing that's really interesting about New York, what I'm showing you here is, uh, employment, the national economy, the shaded area, the state of New York, the black line, uh, everything is, is normalized to uh, 2000. So go back two cycles. And then Rochester, the yellow line. What's interesting to me is gas shale is not a part of New York's economy. And yet the New York economy has come back better than the national economy. Employment now is 2% above where it was in the last, the, at, the, at the 2007 peak. And I think that speaks a lot to the diversity of the New York economy and, and to the advantages of the area uh, that, uh, that's, that we're not, we're not, this is not happening because of, um, of gas shale and energy. Um, now, one, one comment about the uh, economic data that we've gotten so far. I really don't trust data uh, because it's very difficult. As Charlie pointed out, the data are very noisy. And it's very difficult to get what's really going on because so much activity in small businesses is hard to track, hard to keep up with. But there is one, there is one indicator I really like a lot. And if you ask most of my peers, you're only, if you ask us, we're only allowed to look at one piece of information. What would it be? Most of us would tell you weekly jobless claims. And that's what I'm showing you on this picture. Uh, the black line is weekly claims. The scale is on the right-hand side. It's upside down so that when layoffs go down, that black line goes up. And so as things improve, the black line goes up. And I'm overlaying it on top of GDP growth. And there's a couple reasons we like this. Number one is timely. Tomorrow morning, you'll get the information that happened a week ago. Number two, no matter where you live, Rochester, Monroe, Louisiana, Ely, Nevada, if you lose a job, you go file for unemployment benefits. Virtually everybody belongs to the unemployment insurance system. If you lose a job, no matter where you live, you go file for an unemployment benefit. I see you a week later. I don't know why it happened. I just see you. I know it's happening. And, but what, what the picture kind of implies is that although layoffs are really only a part of the dynamic that goes on in the labor market, it's very connected to what happens in the economy. So when the economy shutters, you see the, the pace of jobless claims moves. So we pay, we pay a lot of attention to this. And the reason to point it out is because if you had only been looking at jobless claims for the last two years, three years, you would have realized what we economists learn when we study our history is that we make a lot of mistakes, we're always stumbling, we get back on our feet, and, and when we start getting back on our feet, it has a lot of momentum. So that when you get a signal that the things are happening that tell you we're getting back on our feet, it means there's something powerful going on. And if you'd only paid attention to the jobless claims, the black line going up, you would have realized over the past several years to tune out all the noise about government shutdown, debt ceiling crisis, Europe blowing up, the Arab Spring, all this stuff is noise that what this black line was telling you is the pace of layoffs was coming down consistently, and that meant that the economy was getting back on its feet. And I think this is probably one of the more compelling, the, the, more, the, the more compelling pieces of information we have that what's been going on for the past several years is for real. And um, my, w the other thing to remember is 100 years from now, when they look back at this period, they will see the same black line. They will not see the same shaded area for GDP because that will be revised many times. 
And I think that's why, that, that's why we like to look at it. It can be noisy, weather can disrupt, seasonal things are hard to get, but the pattern is what you're looking for. Now, uh, just a couple thoughts on 2014 and beyond and why it is that many of us are becoming much more optimistic. For one thing, there, there have been three big headwinds we've been dealing with that are beginning to die down. And there's a couple tailwinds building up. One of them is the European crisis, uh, the existential crisis that Europe had that forced them to do a lot of things that slowed the economy down. When a region as large as the European community goes from growing 2.5% to stalling, it's going to have an impact on a lot of folks. So a lot of that slowdown that's going on in the developing economies, a lot of it is related to what happened in Europe. That's over. That's over because of the words and the actions that the central bank took, and we're starting to see some new signs of life in Europe. So the feeling coming out of Europe is going to be a little better this year than it has been, and I think for developing economies, that big headwind is going to be dying down. Secondly, the public sector here has been a big headwind. We, they spent a lot of money in 2009 and 10 to cushion the downturn in the economy, and by design, that fiscal stimulus has been winding down for the last several years. If you were in the school system, you knew this story because in 2010, a lot of that money disappeared. So this is the first time I can remember that we, we've had a recovery that really we've had the public sector, which for a while was cushioning the downturn, but it's been unwinding a lot of this stimulus. And thirdly, the, uh, the, all the mistakes that were made in the real estate sector, for the last several years, we've been cleaning up that. This is the first recovery we've ever had where you didn't have the support of the housing industry. The home building industry has been underbuilding in order to clean up the problem. And for that reason, an awful lot of the, the you know, the, it's, it's amazing to me that we've actually had an economy growing because we all had an idea a while ago that it's very difficult to get a real recovery going without the housing sector. That's all changing. Housing last year became a positive and it's slowly, supporting the economy. So it's not that, you know, last year to me is not, is not an indicator of what our underlying steady state pace is. It's, it's because there's a lot of things in motion here and there's a lot of things that are changing. And so these headwinds are dying down and that means that 2014 ought to be feeling and ought to be doing a little better than what we saw last year. And then when you add to that, several big headwinds that are building in the manufacturing sector, the dollar where it is, trade weighted terms, is generating new signs of life in the manufacturing sector, and that's why a lot of work is coming back to the Mexico region. Mexico is a cousin of the U.S. manufacturing sector, and it's real interesting to me that suddenly everybody wants to go to Mexico, and that's telling you that manufacturing is coming back, and it's partly because the dollar is very competitive, and it's partly because it's getting more expensive to do things in China. But secondly, another tailwind, We've had, with the stock market recovering over the last several years, it's created a tremendous amount of wealth. Yeah, January was down, but the truth is, if you look at what happened last year with house prices beginning to come back up now that the, now the prices have corrected, and debt levels coming down, and debt service at low levels that I've ever seen, and the equity market coming back, household net worth has recovered to the tune of $8.5 trillion last year. We economists, you know, we don't know how this plays out in the economy, but we know that when rising, when wealth is rising like this, it has an impact on the consumer. And I think for that reason, don't be shocked if you see the consumer sector this year doing, uh, doing very well. So let me close on one, one thought, because I think it's, a, it, it's, it's an important thing to, to think about and to um, ask yourselves. Um, when I look at... Um, when I look at the performance of the U.S. economy compared with all the other advanced economies, all my colleagues are asking, why is it that the U.S. economy, where all the real estate problems were, is coming out of this thing better than anybody else? If you, if you go, if you turn the clock back to 2007 and you think about, and you think about what you might have thought back in 2007, house prices, we realized belatedly they'd gotten way out of whack. Prices, we lost a third of the value of these houses. And when you thought about all the underwater mortgage problems that would be plaguing the household sector, and you tried to think out what would it take to get out of the hole that we'd gotten into, many people thought it might take several decades to work out of the problems that we got to. And you didn't have to look too far to figure out how this might work, because all you had to do was look at Japan. It's taken them several decades. And yet here we are powering out of a very bad recession. 
what's going on? I personally think there's a lot of differences between Japan, Europe, and the U.S., but I personally think that we are going to come to realize that our financial system forced us to clear the decks faster than in, in other systems. And if you think about what is unique about the U.S. compared to Japan and Europe, most residential loans are securitized. And what that means is when we make a mistake and things get out of whack, the market belatedly figures this out, and the market revalues those securities, and it forces us to mark to market to the new reality and clear the decks faster. And that's been going on in the home building business. It's been going on in the financial industry. And I really think it's our financial system that, that helps correct when we make mistakes, corrects the problems faster, helps us get back, to get, get back on board faster. And I think that did not happen in Japan. This is why it took the Japanese so long to finally break out of the problems that they'd had. So I personally think that w when you ask, why is it that the U.S. is doing so much better, it's because we, when we make mistakes, the only way you can really move forward is by fixing the problems and getting behind you. And I think that that is really what's been going on for the past several years. And this is why I'll repeat what my own, what my own boss says. When you're thinking about where we're going, the news is going to be noisy, the weather is going to distort a lot of things, but the alignment is right. When you're trying to figure out where we're we going, it's most important to think about what is our alignment and getting the mistakes that we made behind us and, uh, you know, inflation very low. Uh, there's just a lot of opportunity out there, and I think that's why um, the, the, the period ahead is going to be pretty good. I think it's going to be a lot better than it's been feeling for a while, so thank you. Thanks, Jim. Charlie, we have time for a few quick questions. Yes, Ron. Uh, Charlie, thank you for your remarks, particularly stating how your personal opinion is sometimes at variance with the FOMC as a whole. Um, you talked about the fact that the Fed funds rate has been driven to zero and it's been held there for five years, a, a totally unprecedented amount of time, and that's something that's allowed Sandy's Bank to keep the prime rate, I believe, at three and a quarter for these same five years. The general Wall Street view, obviously th the future is data dependent, is that most of calendar year 19, uh, uh, 2014 will be used to complete the tapering end and that it'll be 2015 before the Fed really considers raising the Fed funds rate, so that there will be six years of zero rates. Um, my question is, do, uh, it, in my opinion, after such an extended period at very low interest rates, a 200, say a, a two-point rise in the Fed funds rate would have a much larger impact on economic activity in the United States than we saw in the 80s, 90s. Uh, of changes, uh, such a magnitude change in the Fed funds rate because we've gotten used to very low rates for a very long time. But what do I know? I'd be very interested in what research you have at the Federal Reserve or your professional opinion about what this extended period of low rates will do when the Fed ultimately does increase the Fed funds rate. I think that's a very good, very good question. I think um, what you point out is, is what I've pointed out many times over the last several years. We are, and in many cases have been for quite some time, in uncharted territory as far as monetary policy is concerned. And um, being in uncharted territory also means that the risk of unintended consequences can be significant because we don't have a lot to go on historically or otherwise to um, uh, plot a course that you might believe where you have a lot of confidence in what's going to happen when you do certain things. And so I think you're, you're correct to say that we as policymakers and we at the Fed should be uh, worried about the law of unintended consequences and whether or not we can in fact execute the plan that we sort of think would get us there, whether markets will get ahead of us very rapidly, uh, how, how fast we might have to chase rates up, for example, or whether we have to push them up in a way that would cause other sorts of uh, disruptions in, in, in the financial markets. 
I think it's safe to say we don't have very good answers for those sorts of questions. Um, that's actually part of the reason why I have been reluctant to be as aggressive on accommodation as we have been, in part because of the consequences of coming out on the other side and what it might mean. If we're lucky, and then things will go really smoothly and we can gradually lift our ways out of that and we'll have the Goldilocks soft landing, as, as they said. But um, as I sometimes say, it's important to have plan B in case plan A goes awry and, and be comfortable with that. So I think it's a fair, we don't have a good answer to your question. It is something that we should be concerned about and all the more reason from my start, from my perspective, that the sooner we can sort of begin to gradually adjust to this, the better off we'll be, rather than, what's the old saying, when you're digging a hole, the first thing to do to get out is to stop digging. And so I think that's, that's what we have to do, and, um, and the, it could, could prove to be very tricky, but uh, let's hope not. <laughs> I was very interested in, in your New York specific slide that showed that we're growing along with the national average. I wondered if you could just opine a little bit on where the rest of the state would look without uh, the financial markets in New York affecting that growth. And I was also curious if you had done any research, you mentioned shale energy and sort of downplayed the economic effect that it's had in other states. If you could just talk a little bit about where the states that have tapped that energy, uh, where their growth rates are in comparison to New York, and how that might compare if Manhattan was backed out of that model. I have a, there's a picture that shows how all the states are doing. Uh, I don't show North Dakota because it's off the charts. So it's clear, and we haven't heard the full story about North Dakota, according to people that are there, there's just becoming, there's just a lot more coming in, in terms of discovery. So if you look at, well, Texas is off the charts. Oklahoma is quite good. Uh, Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania, you, you can see the contrast when you look at Western Pennsylvania versus Philadelphia. Uh, it's clear that gas shale development has been a real boon for those areas. But it's not just about that. I, the thing that was interesting to me, you know, when we had the hurricane here, Hurricane Sandy, I was out in um, Southern California seeing clients, and they were getting orders from um, the tax account from off, for office furniture from New Jersey. So we're all very connected to all this stuff. So if something big is going on in North Dakota, it's benefiting everybody. I really think the important story is not so much, you know, this has been going on for a while. I think it's hard to exaggerate the implications of gas shale for the economy, because, but I think the real benefit is the edge we have in, to, in the development of the technology, because this is going to be an important export for us in Asia and Europe as they get their act together. But there's a lot going on still in this country. When you see gas prices and oil prices so out of sync, there's a huge incentive there to try to take advantage of the, what all this discovery of sh the shale has, has done. We're, we're using more natural gas to produce electricity now. Some of the trucking industry is shifting to CNG technology. In middle of Michigan, Dow Chemical is talking about beefing up you know, petrochemical operations in the U.S. You no longer have to go abroad. But I think it's when we, pat, when we, you know, we have options, more choices to use this technology in passenger in tr transportation, that's probably how this plays out. So I think there's a lot of upside to it. It's just that, you know, I, I doubt it's the kind of thing, it's not the kind of thing that's going to tell you that this year's growth is going to be X, Y, Z more than last year's. It's ongoing and um, a, a big plus. And by the way, with, for, within New York, it's, um, I don't think it's just New York City because you see, you know, when you look at the community by community uh, across the state, it's all over the map. The Ithaca area is booming. We're doing okay here. There's some areas that are struggling, Binghamton. So, you know, when I, but when I look at New York story, it doesn't look like a cyclical story anymore. It looks like there are structural stories within the state. Some communities struggling with companies that pulled out maybe. So, um, I, th I think the New York state story is a little more complicated. But this area, you know, with the manufacturing sector coming back and with, the, with Michigan economy doing better. Um, I think the western part of 
New York is going to be, is, is, you're feeling some of that. I want to thank uh, Charlie and Jim, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, our sponsor, the CFA Society of Rochester, RBA, uh, our advancement team led by Christian Gordon, our marketing communications team led by Kier Meisner, and then ways we could help uh, to the local uh, business uh, community. Uh, first and foremost, we have a few current students with us, if they could stand. I know there's some back there and some... If you're looking for talent, our brand positioning statement, as you saw in the um, brochure, is toughen up. We want to be authentic from the get-go. So this is something Jim mentioned. It still remains a challenging economy. And we believe, ultimately, if we can attract people like these folks standing uh, that want to play with the best and with training and hard work, it'll serve you well. Uh, it'll serve them well and it'll serve Simon School well. So if we can get you access to the talent, our surveys tell us 70% want to stay in the area. If we could connect you with one of them for an internship or a full-time job, just let us know. We'd like to do more professional matchmaking. 10% come from the area, 15% right now end up staying. So thank you for standing. If we can help you with continuing ed, our executive MBA program as of this fall goes to a hybrid model, a quarter delivered online which will allow students to access the material uh, every fourth weekend as opposed to every other weekend uh, so we can broaden our reach. We also offer a variety of uh, part-time options, both MBA and MS. Connections, uh, 12,000 alums, uh, people like Doug Petno that uh, uh, Sandy referred to. And uh, last, uh, with speakers, uh, for those of you that want to test your driving skills further today, at 3.30, we have our next SANS lecture series uh, that the SANS family generously has sponsored at the Simon School. Uh, Mike Jensen, the faculty member that really put Simon on the map, uh, we just got rated fourth in the world by the Financial Times and Finance, uh, third in economics. He was a key driver to putting us on the map. He'll be back to give a talk. We'll want to thank him, and especially for the alums that had him as a teacher. We have a framed uh, gift that we want to give them as in gratitude, so feel free to affix uh, your signature. We'll be announcing our 11th professorship to uh, an alum yesterday, decided to make a commitment to name a professorship in Mike Jensen's honor. Uh, so we'll also be celebrating that occasion with them this afternoon at 3.30. So join us if you can at Schlegel 407. We wish you a happy and prosperous 2014 belatedly. A less belatedly happy year of the horse. Uh, may it bring you a lot of uh, health and well-being. So thank you for joining us for this 35th seminar.